The electrons always try to get from a negatively charged body to one that is positively charged in relation to it. In 1924, the French physicist Louis de Broglie built on Einstein's work on the photoelectric effect, where it was discovered that light can behave as both a wave and a particle. De Broglie posited that not only can light behave as a particle, but matter can also behave as a wave. And he formed an equation that connected a wave property, wavelength, to a matter property, momentum. His equation suggests that all matter has a wavelength. This means that even you and I have wavelengths of our own. The thing is though, according to this equation, the bigger the mass, the smaller the wavelength. So the wavelength of a person is completely negligible. However, an electron is so tiny that its wavelength becomes significant. So not only can it behave as a particle, it can behave as a wave. This was proved experimentally a few years later by two separate groups who independently performed very similar experiments. One group was led by the English physicist George Paget Thompson, the son of Joseph John Thompson who discovered the electron. The other group was led by the American physicist Clinton Davison. Each team fired electrons at different materials and managed to observe a diffraction pattern, something very specific to waves that ordinary particles cannot do. And so they observed for the first time electrons actually behaving as waves. Soon after de Broglie published his theory of the wave-particle duality of electrons, Austrian physicist Owen Schrödinger investigated whether the movement of an orbiting electron in an atom could be better explained as a wave rather than a particle, and he got to work determining an equation to describe this wave system. In 1926, he published his findings across multiple papers where he defined an equation that describes these wave-like electrons in the atom. Let's look at how this works. Imagine a guitar string that's connected at two ends. If we pluck the string, we get a standing wave which, rather than progressing along the string, vibrates in place. Schrodinger said that electrons orbit the atom as circular standing waves. This means that we can only get an integer number of wavelengths that can exist around that circle. Since a wave's energy is related to its wavelength, this explains why only specific energy levels are allowed according to Bohr's model. However, the problem with Bohr's model was that he viewed the electrons solely as particles. This new wave theory helped to explain the quantization of the energy levels. Now, the equation that Schrödinger established contained something called imaginary numbers, meaning it couldn't correspond to something that was measurable in the real world. However, this problem was solved by German physicist Max Born, who was another student of Thomson. Born believed that the square of Schrödinger's wave function was related to the probability of finding an electron at a specific distance from the nucleus. This allowed scientists to use these wave functions to model complicated three-dimensional orbitals which are overlapping regions of space around the nucleus where you're likely to find different electrons. And this new orbital theory was much better at predicting the observed spectra of different atoms. Another German physicist, Werner Heisenberg, who was a student of both Bohr and Born, quickly identified a strange consequence of these probability distributions. Essentially, he realized that since electrons are not simple particles in space but behave more like waves, it's impossible to measure both an electron's position and its velocity with a high degree of certainty. This is because a wave cannot have a specific position in space like a particle can. The more precisely you know the position of an electron, the less precisely you can know its velocity and vice versa. This became known as the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle. De Broglie, Schrödinger, Born, Heisenberg, Davison and Thomson would all go on to win Nobel Prizes for their work. Interestingly, this meant that Joseph John Thomson won the Nobel Prize for proving the electron was a particle and his son, George Paget Thomson, won the Nobel Prize for proving that it was also a wave. And so, the more scientists learned about the quantum nature of the electron, the more bizarre our very reality became. The true nature of matter is one of probabilities and uncertainties. If you're finding this confusing, that's fine, so does everybody else. The physics of the quantum world is a lot less concrete than the world we can see around us.